Glory be to the Father, to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Welcome to another edition of Lectio Divina Quotidiae. I am Victor in the Psalter, Oblate of St. Benedict, and lover of the Holy Word of God. After we go through today's daily readings from the Mass, we will reflect on the readings following the Lectio Divina method of the Benedictine tradition. If this is your first time encountering one of the videos, uh, Lectio, Lectio, Lectio Divina Quotidia videos, it just means that we're going to look at what we think the Holy Spirit, what is the Holy Spirit saying to us through this reading today. Without further ado, let's go straight to the first reading of today. I'm going with the New American Translation. And the first reading today comes from uh, the letter of St. Paul's of the Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 to 11. Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 to 11. Have among yourselves the same attitude that is also yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not regard equality with God something to be grasped. Rather, he emptied himself taking the form of a slave coming in human likeness, and found human in appearance. He humbled himself, becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Because of this God greatly exalted him, and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bend, of those in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Responsorial Psalm is taken from Psalm 22. Psalm 22, verses 26 to 27, and then 28 to 30. I will offer praise in the great assembly. My vows I will fulfill before those who fear him. The poor will eat their fill, those who seek the Lord will offer praise. May your hearts enjoy life forever. All the ends of the earth will remember and turn to the Lord. All the families of nations will bow low before him. For kingship belongs to the Lord and the ruler, the ruler over the nations. All who sleep in the earth will bow low before God. All who have gone down into the dust will kneel in homage. Alleluia, Alleluia, Alleluia. The Lord be with you. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Luke. Glory to you, O Lord. One of his fellow guests, on hearing this, said to him, Blessed is the one who will dine in the kingdom of God. He replied to him, A man gave a great dinner to which he invited many. When the time for dinner came, he dispatched his servant to say to those invited, Come, everything is now ready. But one by one they all began to excuse themselves. The first said to him, I have purchased a field and must go to examine it. I ask you, consider me excused. And another said, I have purchased five yoke of oxen, and am on my way to evaluate them. I ask you, consider me excused. And another said, I have just married a woman, and therefore I cannot come. The servant went and reported this to his master. When the master of the house, in a rage, commanded his servant, go out quickly into the streets and alleys of the town, and bring in here the poor and the crippled, the blind and the lame. The servant reported, Sir, your orders have been carried out, and still there is room. The master, the master then ordered his servant, Go out to the highways and hedgerows, and make people come in, that my home may be filled. For I tell you, none of those men who were invited will taste my dinner. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. 
<clears throat> so let's go to the first reading. And I'm going to invite the Holy Spirit to tell me what is it that He wants to share with us today from this wealth of Scripture. Well, I'll tell you what stood out to me, what always stands out to me about this particular reading is um, there's a story of an exorcist. I think it was uh, Father Amorton before he passed away. He said that during exorcisms, whenever he reads the scripture, uh, wherever it says, uh, every knee should bend of those in heaven and on earth and under the earth, that even the person possessed by the demon would get on one knee and bend. I mean, would genuflect. That at the power of the word, power of the spirit, the command of, of God, of, through the priest, this um, diabolical spirit would actually force the possessed person to kneel at the sound of the scripture. So it shows the power that uh, scripture has over the, over the demonic spirits and uh, the, most importantly the power of the name, the name of Christ. Um, but how did Jesus Christ get to this point? What was he trying to teach us through his incarnation? I think the first few verses here summarize his entire purpose, how he defeated Satan. He emptied himself. He took the form of a slave in that he didn't consider himself his own property. He knew who he belonged to. He knew he belonged to the Father. And that's an example we must follow. We must know that we are not our own. We have been purchased at a price. We belong to Jesus Christ. And I like how it says he was found to be, he came in human likeness and was found in human appearance. Which I, I think this is Paul's way of stressing the fact that um, Jesus is the divine person. That he is the second person of the Holy Trinity who came under the appearance of human flesh through the incarnation. That it was an assumption, assumption of human flesh, assumption of a human nature. Something he was a, he had total, total and complete control over. It's a great mystery how he could be totally human and God at the same time. But from there we learn how to become a part of his divine nature by emptying ourselves of our egos and becoming free from all attachments to this world, free from all attachments to created things. And then if we go to the psalm, it's a response to this whole idea of giving your life to God, not belonging to yourself, but belonging to God, and therefore receiving the kingdom of God as a reward. Because the response is, I will offer praise in the great assembly. My vows I will fulfill. When you realize that you are a child of God and that you belong to God and you rejoice in that status, then you will say, I will offer praise in the great assembly. I will offer praise. What else can we do but offer praise when we realize that we belong to God? All the ends of the earth will remember and turn to the Lord. All the ends of the earth will remember and turn to the Lord. There's a lot of um, prophecy there in that eventually this world will realize that technology cannot solve everything. Science cannot solve all the, the human condition. And eventually everyone's going to realize we need, we need the Lord, we need Jesus Christ. And I think that will be the moment when God finally returns. When the whole world gets to a point where there's nowhere else to look, there's nowhere else to go. To whom shall we go? Only you have the words of eternal life. All the ends of the earth. And of course there's some... Um, there's some um, allusion to the fact that Jesus rose from the dead and that he, he descended to the realm of the dead and he freed the dead uh, prior to his resurrection. All the uh, Old Testament prophets and saints. Um, this is amazing that, uh, you know, centuries before, centuries before Christ even rose, the psalmist wrote, all who sleep in the earth will bow low, will will bow low before God. 
All who sleep in the earth will bow low before God. How can the dead worship unless they're in a place where they're still conscious and where they're still, in other words, they're still in afterlife. And then all who have gone down to the dust will kneel in homage. How can you go down to the dust and kneel? Um, I don't think this is symbolic. I think it's prophetic in that Christ descended to the realm of the dead, Sheol, and freed the dead from the shackles of sin at the moment of his uh, act of redemption. It's a powerful, powerful scripture. When you really put things together, it just, it sinks in so deeply because it's so easy to get lost in that biblical language and just think, yeah, la di la di da praise the Lord, praise the Lord. But we don't get the context. We don't get the, the deeper meaning, the um, anagogical meaning. So we just learned from the first reading how Paul says Christ emptied himself, took the form of a slave, and then God exalted him. Exalted him to the point that he could just freely go down to the dead and free them and liberate them. And the beauty of it is, is that he does the same thing for us now. And then we have the Holy Gospel where Jesus mentions a king or a man who gave a great dinner and invited many. But people were too busy. People were making up excuses not to go. Isn't that so much like the church now? Isn't that the situation in the church now? People are just too wrapped up in their selfish ways, materialistic ways, to even care about the Holy Eucharist, to even care about praying the Holy Word and living, living as if you're in a domestic church, making your home a domestic church. Spirituality has such little value now. And, but then he says, this uh, person who invited the dinner guests, he says, go out and find the suffering. Go find the cripple. Go find the blind. Because only when you're suffering can you feel vulnerable, uh, vulnerable enough to call upon God. Only when you're suffering do you realize your own frail condition and it's that kind of person that becomes a good disciple the one who is broken and realizes that lifting weights you know for an hour a day isn't going to do it um, going and learning mixed martial arts isn't going to do it it's something spiritual that needs to be addressed spiritually so such a relief, such a healing can only take place through total and utter commitment to the Lord Jesus Christ. And I'm learning this day by day. So the beauty of it is that God calls all of us so much so that he, he, says, he says, go out to the highways and go out to the head roads and make people come that my home may be filled, that God wants his holy heavenly temple to be filled with true worshipers, worshipers of, uh, in spirit, worshipers in spirit and truth, people who truly desire the divine life, people who truly desire the risen life in Christ. And those who seem too busy with worldly affairs, they're, they're, they're going to miss out. They, they miss out because they, they've chosen their path. They've chosen their reward in created things. How well does this translate in modern times? If I, you could almost reread this in a modern context and say that um, um, a parish priest gave a great dinner and invited many, but a lot of his parishioners said, uh, "I just got. I need to go and put a down payment on a new car, and we're going to go. We're going on a family road trip, and um, I just don't have time. No time for the community life." Or, um, I got a date with a pretty girl, um, we don't really have time for all this church stuff. I'm, I've been guilty of this too, and it's a, it shows how powerful the spirit of the world is, because it draws us away from our true happiness, which can be found in the spiritual life, in the Christian life. But the good news is that God sends His messengers, His angels whether they be missionaries or even just a close friend or a stranger even, 
to come and find us and bring us, bring us back into the state of grace. With that, I would like to end with a personal account on how powerful, how powerful the devil is at dragging you down. We all know about the recent attacks that happened in France at a Catholic church, and I'm not going to go into the motives and the backgrounds of the people who committed these crimes, but I just remember feeling this real, this real sense of rage, this crusading rage, thinking, oh no, now it's our chance, now it's, we, we've been putting up with this for so long, we need to react, we need to retaliate, fight fire with fire, and the more I gave in to these thoughts, the more I became overwhelmed with all this negative thinking and it began to spill over into my family life. I was becoming short with my children, yelling at them and treating them hor horribly, um, being very impatient and acting very uh, rude and cold and unprofessional on the job, complaining all the time. Um, it just began to really take root in my life, this evil presence. And that's what happens. Um, the devil will make you think you're, you're right, you're justified. You're justified in your rage, and then he'll start putting these horrible thoughts into your mind. And because of your vulnerability, because of your rage, you will begin to believe them and think that they're true. You'll think that it's the... Um, I remember reading a work by um, a Coptic Orthodox monk. He says, one of the ways that the devil controls people is through violence. This um, delusion that violence is the only solution. That violence is the only way to fix things. But we've been trying that for centuries now, fighting violence with violence, and it, and it, and it, hasn't, really, it hasn't really helped anything. What has helped, what has helped is when people give themselves over to prayer, because then we invite the true power of God into our lives and into the world. So I had a really rude awakening. Um, it, was a, it was a very difficult presence to get rid of. And how did I get rid of it? Well, at my lunch break today, I went out to, uh, we have a soccer field on our campus, and I just isolated myself like a monk in a way. Went out there and prayed my uh, Liturgy of the Hours. I was a bit late to pray mid-morning prayer, so I prayed mid-morning prayer um, and midday prayer all at once. I needed that extra dose of the Psalms. And while I was praying, I was, I was, I was saying, God, I, I don't want this dark presence. I don't want this dark presence in me. Please fill me with your spirit. I invite you back into my life. I invite you into this darkness. Please rid me of this evil presence that fills me with so much hatred. And it didn't go away immediately because there was still, it had such a foothold in my life that uh, I, in a sense I gave it authority over my life and the more I really sincerely tried to invite the Holy Spirit back in that's when I began to feel my muscles begin to relax my I became less tense and gradually things I, you know all the, the the veil was lifted and I realized just how horrible how horrible evil how horrible the devil is and how how subtle he is at worming his way into your life don't look for some, you know, cloven-footed, uh, horned character, you know, prancing around your room. Um, look, look for him here, because that's where he likes to work, especially here. He's going to start working here on your brain, on your mind, and on your thoughts. Be careful what you're thinking. That's why in the Bible it says you should always think about Christ. Always be Christ-centered. Have your eyes on Christ at all times. Have your eyes on the kingdom. Because what else is there? Really, what else is there? So I'd like to come back to... I'd like to come back to the psalm. Where it says... The poor will eat their fill. Those who seek the Lord will offer praise. May your hearts enjoy life forever. So the poor, not the, not the economically poor, remember, those who are, who are spiritually poor, those who say, I depend on God, I need God, I need God, I need help. I can only claim my sins, I need God. That is, 
Only then can we seek the Lord and offer him praise forever. So I hope you got something out of this today. Please join me next time.